For those who don't know me, I was born and raised in an international religious cult, and it was actually a Christian cult. And unfortunately, it was tens of thousands of children born and raised all over the world, and trafficking was one of the many forms of abuse. This was our lifestyle. This was us being born and raised under a rock and having no access to the outside world. Real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let the show begin. It is such an honor and such a privilege to have you join me finally. I really enjoyed watching your live yesterday. It's just crazy to see all of the comments and how many people. Is it really a big thing where do people really seriously think this is still a big conspiracy? I get that a lot. And I don't know that it's the majority of people, but a lot of people will still associate this topic with some sort of, I have to laugh, right? Because some sort of conspiracy theory, some sort of political talking point, some sort of one-sided something, something narrative. It's sad that people lack that awareness. It's sad that things have been so disproportionately blown into talking points that don't make any sense and that so many politicians have used this to talk a little bit about it in order to gain support, but not enough to raise awareness and not actually doing anything about it. So of course, that's where I just can't justify or make excuses for any of that. Well, they don't want to fix something that's their moneymaker. Why would they want to fix it? Oh, for sure. That? For sure. Like you saw me last night where I really try to unpack the logic in a way that helps people unpack the logic for themselves. Because I'm not here to take away your political preferences or whatever it is. But I have a problem with people making too many excuses for specifically our elected officials. It's not that they have the only responsibility, but they do have the responsibility to protect and serve. And we do fund them with our tax dollars. And they are the ones who are responsible. So yes, we- They're the hired in, for a job. Correct, That's yeah, they, they got one job. Yeah, It's pretty specific, you know, so- I mean, again, the fact that they won't even talk about it, I just can't justify that at all. The fact that people justify it and have been told that some of these people or politicians are talking about it and or did something or are doing something about it. That's where it actually becomes problematic because people think that wishing it away or they can just defer the responsibility onto the next guy they do or don't vote for. That then removes their personal responsibility for them to take action, be on guard and do something helpful and active in their community. So yeah. I do have to be careful with the messaging in the sense of unpacking little bite sized pieces because people cannot handle the full truth. And I'm not here to walk them through the gruesome details for one. And for two, there's so much to try to absorb and wrap your mind around when it comes to this dark criminal enterprise. And if you're not evil or psychotic, you cannot compute the mind of someone who is evil and psychotic. So all that to say, yeah. it's about gleaning the points that the public must know and the undeniable truth and facts that you really can't deny unless you choose to live in denial and giving people the opportunity to evaluate and unpack those facts for themselves, come to a reasonable conclusion, have time to chew on it and assimilate and accept because it's hard for people to accept the level of evil. It was hard for me as well. I've said when I first started in this, the hard part is comprehending how bad it is. The easy part is picking something to do about it. So a lot of people are stuck in this resistance where they don't want to accept. They do not want to acknowledge. They do not want their guy to be at fault. They don't want it to be true. And here's the thing, right? The truth ain't always pretty. A lot of times the truth will piss you off. It'll only set you free if you choose to accept it, acknowledge it and take action. And it can actually be empowering when you choose to utilize it for the sake of action. I mean, and, and do you really want to have those false perceptions about somebody who has that power and control? Exactly. Ignorance is not bliss. Not when it comes to the way it's affecting us, our society, our economy, our 
country, but specifically not when it comes to children. Ignorance is not bliss. Pretending like this isn't a problem is not making the bad guys go away and it's not helping children. So this wishful thinking that we can thoughts and prayers it away is not helping. And in fact, I believe it's part of the problem. I believe it's part of why this criminal enterprise is thriving and it's the second largest criminal enterprise on the planet and it's the fastest growing and it's the most profitable. Why? They can get away with it. They can get away with it until now. Because our generation will be the one to end this. We will. Amen. Amen. Until now, they have been allowed to get away with it. So I define awareness like this because, look, real quick, I've worked with a lot of nonprofits. I'm very skeptical of nonprofits. And I encourage everybody to be very skeptical of nonprofits and really vet them. Specifically, evaluate their results. What are you actually doing? So a lot of nonprofits will say we raise awareness. And that sounds really nice. But sometimes those are just words. When it comes to child trafficking, though, awareness isn't just a feel good term. Awareness reduces the predator's ability to operate. It makes it harder for bad guys to do bad things and get away with doing the bad things to children. If we the people are aware. Now, what does it mean to be aware and what are we doing with that awareness? Because that's part two. See, awareness is step one. It's acknowledgement. My house is on fire. If we pretend like it's not on fire, it is going to burn to the ground. Now, it may already be burning, but if you in your mind convince yourself it couldn't be on fire, I've never seen it on fire before. The local media isn't talking about it. Our politicians have never talked about that. I don't think that could be true. That seems like a real hassle and I'm not a firefighter right now. It's going to burn to the ground. But here's the thing. There are some things we could still save. And when it comes to children, look, this is a messed up analogy, but yes, it's on fire. And yes, we can still save some things that are worth saving and it matters. So step one is awareness, which to me means acknowledgement and acceptance. My house is on fire. Step two, you get the things and put the fire out. You take the action because some people, I put this into various categories. There are people who don't want to be aware and that's that blissful ignorance. Ignorance is a choice these days though. Absolutely. Then there's the people who get stuck in the awareness phase and think that that alone is somehow action. Now, here's the thing. Awareness is step one and action is step two. And awareness without action doesn't help that much. You're not going to solve anything. Correct. It's the foundation for appropriate action. And without awareness, you either won't take action or won't take effective action. So you need to know what the problem is and understand a lot about it in order for your action to be effective. So awareness is step one, but it's almost futile without action. For anyone who's religious, I want you to realize that that book says faith without works is dead. So thoughts and prayers are great, but if you don't take action, it does not make a difference. It does not matter. So for those who don't know me, I was born and raised in an international religious cult, and it was actually a Christian cult. And unfortunately, it was tens of thousands of children born and raised all over the world. And trafficking was one of the many forms of abuse. And this was a daily, this was our lifestyle. This was us being born and raised under a rock and having no access to the outside world, not one safe adult or advocate or example completely inundated with the cult indoctrination and completely separated from anything outside of that narrative. I have a lot to say to Christians, but here's the thing. I'm not here to attack anyone's Christian faith and I'm actually here to help ignite Christians because here's the irony, right? And this is a cult joke, but I can sing that Bible in three languages. I know it's weird, right? (laughs) All of it's creepy, like the cult thing, all of it's creepy and weird. No one's trying to normalize that, right? You say the word, a lot of people, it's sensational. They're like, ooh, cringy. Yes, it is. We're not trying to normal that. Yes, it's fair. But let's unpack a few things about the belief system and the ideologies, because we're talking about people who choose to believe or not believe certain things that are not really optional for us to choose to acknowledge. So relating that to an adult who may be lost in life and maybe they're seeking community and they're very vulnerable, maybe they're going through some kind of thing in their life and they're seeking community and acceptance. So then they find this community and acceptance and peace, love and hugs, and they feel accepted. And now they're part of this is our tribe, our family. Now, there's a big difference in adult who decides to do something kooky with their life 
and a child who is born into that environment, who obviously did not choose or consent and has no access to the outside world is withheld from all other external influences. So just like you can teach a child any language or culture to like any food, you can teach a child that red is blue. And if every single picture on the wall and every book they read and every person around them and every song reinforces this belief that red is blue, that's the child's reality. That's all they know. Now, obviously, we're comparing a child with an undeveloped brain to a fully formed adult. And we're also comparing a fully grown adult who has the knowledge of the outside world. They have context and they made a choice not only to join this ideology or group, but to stay there. Every day of their life, they choose to stay. Now, you can use brainwashing and other words as examples and excuses, but here's why I call BS. Now, let me just be clear. There are definitely situations where adults are victimized, obviously, against their will, and there are various manipulation tactics used to coerce them, to force them, to do a lot of things to manipulate them against their will. So there are very there are differences in certain situations, but I'm talking about adults who aren't drugged or, you know, there's not that type of force beyond their control being used. There's definitely, you could say, brainwashing and manipulation tactics, but that's a mind over matter thing, okay? So let's compare an adult who's claiming brainwash or I didn't know better or they made me do it to a child who's being born on Mars and is told their entire life, like heavily indoctrinated that the earth is a flaming ball of fire. And if you go from here to there, you're going to be burned and everyone's going to be burned and it's all bad, right? I'm using analogies, but they're accurate. Right. Okay? And then that child, without any support and while being told that they're going to like burn into flames or whatever, they decide to make that leap of faith anyway. And then they land on earth and they're like, okay, I didn't burst into flames. And now what I do, I didn't really have a plan B is, you know, after escaping, it was then where do you go? Where's the support system? You don't exist on paper. You don't have a family and or your family is not at all supportive. There's a lot of complexities here. So because I did escape. I had just turned 20 when I escaped that cult. But because I did deprogram myself as a child and teenager, and because many of my peers did the same, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying I'm not trying to make it sound simple. But I am saying I have pretty low tolerance for excuses from grown adults who know better. Now, I say this with love and not necessarily judgment. I say this from lived experience, and I say this now as observing the world and grown adults who know better and who have access to all the information that exists in the palm of their hands on these devices we watch, and they choose. They have the freedom of choice of what they can believe. They have the freedom to look up information and fact check things. They have the ability to be informed, and that's why I say ignorance is a choice. And that's why I don't have a lot of tolerance for excuses for grown adults like you and me who know better and who are or should be responsible for our decisions and actions. Sure. And and the information's out there too. I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of things are monitored and, you know, manipulated. And you'd like to find, but it's there. Absolutely. It's, I mean, and it's just a matter of how you interpret the information that's out there as well. The whole thing that got me interested in, you know, looking into the trafficking issues more, I've always known it was an issue. I've always known it's a concern. I think a lot of people, I'm sure, same as me, what can I do? And it wasn't until I started experiencing, you know, the issues with with my ex and the trauma that that he put my children and I through. And then that turned into family court trauma, which turned into guardian ad litem trauma. And so I'm like, okay, well, let's check the statistics. Let's do some research. And, you know, and that's what started it all. And I tell you what. All the research I've, I'm like the research queen. I am the ultimate nerd. I love to read and I love facts. Hmm. So, I mean, and the government has their own blessed statistics that confirm all of this. Every thing I investigated, every single thing that I researched, it always came back to sex trafficking, mainly with children. And this is our court 
system. And it's all involved and it's yes. all entangled from domestic violence to family courts to CPS to adoptions. And it's it all stems and works together. And the facts are there if you yes. look. Correct. Correct. Now, to be my own de devil's advocate, because I highly encourage people to do their own research, to look through it like you. I did a lot of research initially before jumping into this fight because it was difficult for me to accept that one, this is this bad. And two, is there really not an effort to squelch this? Like, is our government really not even pretending to care? I encourage people to do their own research. However, I will also say that the data out there about child trafficking is severely suppressed, underestimated, inaccurate, etc. So let's unpack the statistics real quick because I'm a data expert. And I'm, you know, I'm nerdy about this. I live yes, in the data do I'm a numbers. Right. <laughs> so here's the thing, like I would like to be more solid about this, but the data itself is not solid. So here, let's right. unpack this. First of all, this needs to be said. Statistics are only based on what's reported. And the majority specifically of child sex trafficking, but of crime in general, is not reported. Traffickers are not filing taxes. Children are not accounted for. This is not something that we can actually quantify. So first of all, the statistics are impossible to have completely accurate. No one knows the real numbers. And there are so many variables and ways that children can be trafficked. It would be impossible to have a completely accurate number, point one. Point two, when you look at the duck gov websites it should give you a lot of cause for concern about not only the wording and how it's mentioned but also how a lot of information has been deleted for example from doj.gov which had and i have screenshots of all of this in history and you can go to the wayback machine websites oh, yeah. where you can see the current version compared to the previous version i believe it was may 2023 just to give you an example, but please do your research. They had a page about, you know, this long about child trafficking. It was around the time that the Sound of Freedom movie came out, which I'm not affiliated with, but it did raise a lot of awareness. And you can look at the Wayback Machine or other things to validate what was there before and what's there now. It used to be a page about this long of information regarding child sex trafficking in the United States around May 2023. That section about this large was delete it. So now the page is much shorter. And the whole section about child sex trafficking at the border was removed. Well, isn't that There's, curious? That's just, you know, ironically weird. Like, it's hard for me to even not be sarcastic about how ridiculous this is, because I can't take it seriously. But even when you look at the DOJ arrests, look up child trafficking. When you look under their stats and arrests, there's like three things in the last 10 years. Wow. Can't play stupid that hard. Like, it's just... I Gotta love transparency in the government, right, huh? Right. Like, <laughs> here's the thing. Whether or not that's due to inaction or lack of transparency, I think they would be promoting and highlighting their work if they were doing that work. Now, I know for sure there are many investigations and things that maybe can't be talked about until the investigation is concluded. There, there, there can be some things there, but... In general, our federal government, the ones we sponsor with our tax dollars, there's just not a lot of concerted effort. So let me say this a different way, more directly, because a big part of my message when it comes to child trafficking awareness is, you know, first of all, this is not a theory. And second of all, this is an intentional problem. And if we see it as something else, then we won't properly tailor our strategy. So for the people that want to research this, there are two options and you can prove me wrong. It's either incompetence, which is a whole other problem that we should also not be tolerant of, or it's intentional. So let, let me give you some more examples of this. I'm gonna ask it in the form of rhetorical questions, okay? Why do you think that our federal government does not have a dedicated agency that is focused on combating human trafficking? Of all the three letter agencies and all the different things that our tax dollars fund, some of which sometimes are effective, most of, you know, not always. But so let me just say that a different way, because I'm not pretending like the government would actually be effective at combating this corruption that they are profiting from. I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that they're not even pretending to care. You know how we have the war on drugs and all these other things that, you know, don't work out all the time, but they're not even pretending they're not even pretending I mean, they're to nothing care. about it. Absolutely nothing. They just let everybody keep 
keep going on thinking oh, maybe it's just a conspiracy or oh it can't be that bad people are Perfect. blowing it out of proportion and Correct. Just let it keep going on. There's a lot of intentional misinformation, not only about whether or not it's real, but about what it is and what it isn't. So often this term trafficking will be used for adult prostitution or sex work or things that are not actually qualified as trafficking in order to, I think, dilute and distract the message, but also due to a massive ignorance about what this is and is not. So Let's back up because we were talking about statistics. So first of all, we all know that human trafficking is a global issue happening all around the world in a lot of third world countries, etc. What most people don't know or want to accept is that the United States is the main problem. We have the highest numbers. We are the main source and the main destination for human trafficking. You don't hear our, our elected officials talking about that or mainstream media. Now, I could ask rhetorical questions like, why isn't mainstream media talking about this? Let me ask you a rhetorical question. Which politicians have you heard talk about child trafficking? So I've overthought this, as you can imagine, right? And it is pathetic and disgusting, a lot of other words that I could use, that of all the elected officials that we have, that we fund with our tax dollars, I can name less than 10 who have made some sounds with their mouth mm. about human trafficking of all the issues, of all the things around the world that we shouldn't necessarily be involved with, we're not even talking about the existence of children being sold and exploited in our country. And mainstream media and even politicians will talk about every detail about XYZ celebrities, dress and ex-boyfriend and whatever drama. But we are not informed. We are intentionally not informed about child Absolutely. sex trafficking in the United States. And the few times it is brought up, it's normally just during campaigning to try to, if at all, you know, voters to try to get them on their side with some cool talking points. And then you don't hear anything about it. And you sure as heck don't see anything done about it. That's for certain. See, that's the whole problem. I don't need them to talk about it. I need them to do something about it. Talking about it would be nice for public awareness, but what they actually need to do is take action. So here's another rhetorical question. And again, this is for the sake of people unpacking the logic and the facts for themselves. And I have a running bet about this and no one's proved me wrong yet. And I'll acknowledge that I don't watch TV and I don't engage in politics because it's all theatrics to me. But here's something I think is alarming. Because first of all, I look at politics in a few ways, but one of them is like salespeople, right? Because they talk and they don't do. Okay, so here's the rhetorical question. Why has a presidential candidate never mentioned the topic of child sex trafficking on a presidential debate stage? Never. I bet you $100. No, I can't now, think of time. Let, right. It, it's never happened. As of today, it's never happened. Now, now here's let's unpack that, because if we look at them like salespeople, why wouldn't you add the topic of protecting children to your sales pitch? So to your point, yes, sometimes they cater for votes and support, but of all the sounds with their mouth that they're making, it's not about children being trafficked. Wouldn't everybody support that? Wouldn't that unite the old, new and the red and the blue? Wouldn't that be something we could all get behind? Now, if they're too cowardly and corrupt, to even make some sounds with their mouth in order to gain support, in order to get voters. We're not even talking about action. I need people to unpack that logic for themselves. The other way I look at politics is like pro wrestling because you're allowed to be entertained by it and get all excited about the drama and the backstory and the costumes and the whatever, but you're not allowed to take it seriously. In 2024, if you're a grown adult, this actually matters. Here's the thing. I was born and raised in third world countries. And there's this understanding that politics are inherently corrupt and not actually for the people. And there's just this it's it's a terrible acceptance, but there is that reality. And unfortunately, in the U.S., there's still this cognitive dissonance where people will, on the one hand, talk about, you know, corruption and election fraud. On the other hand, say, vote for this guy. And you're like, but, but you have to pick one. OK, but here's here's my big problem with that, because I don't care if people are entertained. I care that they are dismissing their responsibility by pretending like they can vote it away or thoughts and prayers it and it'll go bye bye. Damn. Ignorance is not bliss because real children are being harmed. And it is up to we, the people, to do something about it. That's the reality check everybody needs. And that's a very hard thing for most people to accept because it's uncomfortable. 
because that means I have to get off my couch and do something and I can't just thoughts and prayers it away. But it also means accepting that from the top down and from its core, our leadership is corrupted to the core. You can't get more evil than selling and exploiting children for money and power or whatever you're fetish. Right. You cannot get more evil than that. So here's, I'm, I'm a little too sarcastic about it and I got a real dark sense of humor and it's yeah. part of my feeling choice and I don't, I don't apologize for it. It's just a disclaimer. Sometimes I laugh and smile about things that are actually really dark, but it's also because I face this every day and I choose to laugh in the face of this evil because that's the biggest middle finger that you can give it. So here's the thing. It's one thing to not know but it's a different thing when you face someone with the truth and they still don't want to acknowledge it because it conflicts with their narrative or bias or political party or guru. Yes. That's where we're talking about, you know, ideologies and brainwashing and all these things. I understand that more than most people. I understand there is a process by which people are desensitized and lied to. I understand. And this is Hitler's playbook that you mix a lot of lies, initially a lot of truth with some lies and eventually mostly lies with some truth in order to make people accept it hook, line and sinker. However, we the people have a responsibility to not only do something meaning make our communities intolerant of predators, but also hold our elected officials accountable. Yes. I'm not suggesting we revolt. I'm suggesting that we reclaim our power. I'm affirming that we outnumber them, that we don't have to be tactically, you know, go have a physical kinetic fight. That's all we have to do is come together. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Just come together. Absolutely. Of all the issues in the world, that should and will unite us all, this is the hill that we unite on. We can put all our differences aside. I don't need to know anything about your lifestyle, your preferences, your will, it does not matter. If your team protect children, we unite on this hill. We're not here to die. We are here to plant our flag and say, no more. Absolutely not. We're not going to coexist with this evil. We're not going to make excuses for it. We're not going to play dumb. We're not going to pretend like somebody else is going to solve this problem for us. We it shouldn't even be something more. that's debatable. It never fails to amaze me how difficult of a time, you know, as advocates and as those who are, you know, standing up and trying to bring awareness and get people involved. It just amazes me how many people still are just like, and, eh, you know, they take Correct. a step back and it's like, man, these are children. Correct. Yeah, I acknowledge, I accept that for whatever reason, I'm uniquely designed for this mission. And a lot of people are not designed to choose to do what I do. I accept that. And I'm not trying to hold people to a similar standard in terms of dedicating every day of their life to this mission. For right. me personally, I couldn't ignore that call. Like I, I could not identify the exit button from this glaring notification of having to do something. And I actually did for about a year, try to dismiss it, tried to exit that tab. I tried to get other people to talk about it and inspire other people and accepted that I meant to be here. But what's also interesting to me, to your point, is that it's very uncomfortable for people to think about conceptualize them being part of the solution. And I've also, you can tell my brain is very analytical. I've narrowed this down into various categories of the types wow. of cognitive dissonance because my goal is ultimately awareness and action. So then I look at all these target audiences with my marketing brain and I'm like, how can we appeal this message? What are their obstacles? How can we relieve their pain points and actually get them to resonate with this message? Because loosely my message is all of us can do something to be part of the solution. I'm not asking yeah. you to do what I'm doing and vice versa, but I'm saying you with your resources, time, talent, you with your with your funding, you with your connections, you with your time, you with your school expertise, whatever it is, all of us can do something to make a meaningful difference. Now, I've talked to people recently, and this is when as a survivor of child trafficking, a lot of things are very obvious to me that aren't necessarily innate to everybody. So sometimes talking to normal people, I'm able to realize oh, I need to really unpack that. Or, oh yeah, we need to help people understand the difference. So I was talking to a good friend of mine recently who she's known me for a long time and has heard this message and, and is very supportive of the cause. But she said recently, you know, it's difficult for people to think about putting their lives at risk or in danger in order to save a child. And she was being honest about it, which I appreciate. But yeah. I, I was like, wait, wait, wait. 
pause. I'm not asking anyone to put their life at risk. Here's the thing. If you're not a tactically trained service member, law enforcement, frontline response person, I'm not asking you to do something Rambo about this. I'm asking you to hold your elected officials accountable. I'm asking you to get involved in your community. I'm asking you to do what you can do with your skill sets and expertise, but I'm not asking you to risk your life and be Rambo. So here's the thing. A lot of people have this Hollywood ideology of like, I'm going to see a kid who's being dragged around in chains and go save them. And it's like, no, that's not how that's going to work ever. Also, you know, no one's asking you to put your life at risk. So if I can remove some of those obstacles that for whatever reason, people have, you know, well-meaning people who don't know what this looks like, don't know what to do. They just have these different expectations. So I think it's important for people to realize, yes, it's that bad. Yes, it's this pervasive. It's that evil. It's this much. Yes. And yes, little old you and little old me can't completely solve this problem. First of all, we know it's been going on for many millennia. And we know that this is not a you can't you can't destroy evil. You can manipulate energy and everything is energy, but you cannot create or destroy energy. The evil, good and evil, if we're just oversimplifying it, it's a necessary polarity in our world. So like, yes, I'm young and idealistic. And yes, I'm a realist, meaning can we solve this entire problem in general? No. Can me by myself or you by yourself? solve? No. Can we make a difference? Yes. Does making a difference for one child matter? Yes. 10 children, 100 children, 100,000 children. Yes, that matters. And yes, that's our responsibility. And no, none of us should be okay with the fact that we have the responsibility and the ability to do something meaningful. That means we have that power. That means we have that responsibility. Now, here's an interesting concept. What are we the people doing to hold our elected officials accountable? Because yes, it's their responsibility to do their job, but they work for us. So if you change that script, because a lot of people will like to blame and oh, until they, until they, until he, okay, they work for us. How are we managing them? Are we failing to manage? Like, I'm not even trying to be cutesy about this. They literally work for us. Yes. Are we failing to hold them accountable? Are we allowing them to goof off during work hours? Can't take it down. down. (laughs) Right. Are we failing to fire people who are completely rotting our society? Yes, we the people are. So, yes, I hold the appropriate people accountable, which includes we the people. It's an interesting concept because the blame game will get us nowhere. And I see that way too much, both with politics, especially, as well as people in general who say, you'll never make a difference. You'll never solve this. It's just too big. The government's just too corrupt. And I say, you know what? That may be true, but I will not accept that and just allow that to continue. I don't have that ability to observe this type of corruption when it comes to children who cannot defend themselves, who are innocent, who cannot escape or overpower or outsmart a predatory adult. That is not possible. So I have a problem with grown ass adults standing in the corner being afraid of the dark because our job is to turn the lights on. And we have that power. We show the children we will that claim they're power. afraid of because we're there to get the monsters if they are there. We're the ones who should not be afraid of the monsters in the closet. Like, here's the thing. A lot of grown ass adults, and I've talked to these people face to face, some of these big old tactically trained guys that you would think would be real brave and stuff. They look a little me, a petite female. And they're like, man, that's crazy. That's so scary. I don't know how you could do this. I'd be scared. Oh, my, they might come get you and all these things. And I'm like, here's the thing. Boys, step up. I have a problem with grown ass adults who are too scared to think about the bad things that are happening to children on a daily basis. You don't get to let your fear of, you know, what you're making up in your mind be the excuse that holds you back from dealing with the situation that a child is actually experiencing. If your thoughts are that scary, just imagine that child's daily reality. All the love in my heart. I don't tolerate that excuse. Amen. Amen. And it shouldn't be tolerated. And we have to start coming together as a society and, you know, create different perceptions and accept reality for what it is and to tackle that head on. I mean, one of my favorite sayings is you can't change what you can't acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And until we acknowledge that, look, this is happening. This is 
a massive problem that grows bigger every second of every day. And if these all these families across the United States, and I mean, and it's not just across the United States, it's across the world. In the United States particular, if you think it can't happen to you, you know, I mean, you're sadly mistaken. I mean, it it doesn't affect you. Absolutely. So one of those things that I realized quite recently that I have to separate for people in order for us to be effective is also the difference in, okay, because a lot of people, those who are willing to be aware and hear about it, a lot of them get very fearful and paranoid. Oh no, this is terrible. Oh no, I'm going to keep my child in my house and never let them out. That's not the solution either for one. And for two, fear is very, a very weak, low vibration. So that's also not the solution. But here's the thing I need to separate for people. There's what you can do to protect your children from being victims and or being vulnerable to predation. And those are a whole other set of steps. Separately, there's what we can do to help children who are being trafficked or child trafficking survivors. Those may correlate, but they're different strategies. So on the protecting your children side, we're going to talk about internet safety. Are you monitoring their internet activity? Do you have software and devices that you use to monitor their messages and what they're sending and receiving and the pictures and the videos and the people that they're corresponding with? Do you have guidelines and safeguards and things and boundaries that you enforce in your house? Are you communicating with your child? Are they educated on the risks in an age appropriate way? Do you have that open dialogue? Do they know they can trust you and that they can come to you with any kind of weird, scary, sad, weird stories throughout the day? Something that happened from a weirdo guy or person that they encountered. Do they know they can come to you and trust you with the information and that you will listen and take it seriously and take action if needed. I emphasize that because I can't tell you how many survivor stories I've talked to who had some sort of sexual trauma in their earlier childhood, reported it to their family or friends, and it was disregarded. Therefore, it continued and got worse and set them up for a very terrible life. So Talking to our kids, communicating with them, and then also safeguarding our communities. How involved are you with their friends? Do you really know them, not just their names, but really know what they're about? Have you been to their house? Will you let them have a sleepover if you haven't been to their house and haven't met their parents and really know them? So there's all these different practical steps we can talk about when it comes to prevention, education, and empowerment. And that's a whole other book I could write. Yeah. The Because there's a lot here that really matters. Well, there's so many different facets to the entire topic. Absolutely. And like the ages and all these different things like this is a huge thing. And separately, there's how can we help children who are being trafficked? Like this is not, you know, yes, you might talk about some Internet safety aspects, but in general, like that's a totally different set of actions that are needed. And also, what are their needs? Is this helpful for this kid, but not for this kid? What kind of situation have they come out of? What were they traumatized by? Are they not ready to talk yet? Do they need intensive medical care? Is religion trauma time or is it helpful peace and love? This is called trauma-informed care, meaning it's an individualized approach, not a one-size-fits-all stamp of, you know, here's the narrative we need you to follow. So for example, I co-founded a nonprofit called Uniting America, And right now we're building a survivor center for the children that we rescue because we do rescue children. We do counter trafficking operations all over the United States and we do rescue children and take care of the problem. And that's with Philip Drake, who you also interviewed and his team of good guys get the bad guys. And I just get the call that says the kids are safe. So when we intake these children, of course, there are so many variables in terms of their ages, what they've been through, what they're coming to us in what state, et cetera. Trauma informed approach means we're not in forcing some sort of narrative or you have to be on this regimented schedule. Some kids just need to sleep. Some kids don't want to be touched. Some kids need hugs. Some kids want to be alone in nature. Some kids are too scared to be alone. Some kids need really intensive, specific types of medical care and rehabilitation. And obviously all the kids need that type of mental therapy and trauma-informed therapy modalities. For some kids, this might work. And for some, this might be very traumatizing. So it's an individualized approach that takes them where they're at and walks them through the process of empowerment and finding healing, whatever that means for them. 
So again, that's a whole other book I could write, but that's a completely separate approach than protecting our children who, thank God, have not been victimized or you know suffered from the same type of trauma. It's a multifaceted approach. And then, of course, when we talk about actually solving it as a nation, we can talk about the laws and the legislation that exist and that are not being enforced. Yeah, Lord, don't get me started on that. Meaning more <laughs> laws are not the solution. It's already illegal. It is already a crime. However, the laws are not being enforced. So are there certain policies and legislation that could help? Yes, you know, make the, make things better. But if the actual laws are not primarily being enforced, do more laws help? Or are we just laundering money for lobbyists? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all there. I mean, it's, it's there. But uh, yeah, they don't enforce it. And then when you don't have constituents that are holding the powers that be accountable. Sometimes it takes, you know, protesting and rallies and and letters and public uh, awareness. So that's the thing to come together. I mean, that's where it all stems together. Right? You know, it all absolutely. That's where we the people and our power come in. Because here's the thing, if we're marching down the streets yelling about taxes and inflation, that's going to get people's attention. If we're marching down the streets yelling about children being trafficked, we could eventually make enough noise that will force them to acknowledge this topic. I know they won't do it of their own accord. Don't know why I could even laugh about that. But like, it's it's ridiculous for me to not be sarcastic about. They won't do it unless we bully them into it. And I will incentive campaign all day long, y'all. So I want to tell people about some things they can do to actually be part of the solution and help. Because again, a lot of people think this monstrosity problem is way too big for them to solve. Yes. Two steps sometimes, people. Baby steps. (laughs) Absolutely. Baby steps. And what can you do locally? So here are a few things. We're talking pretty generally here, pretty high level. And of course, there's so much more granular we could go, but I'm trying to kind of summarize here. So in general, your local law enforcement, your local politics matter maybe even more so than the federal politics in terms of affecting your actual life. Now, law enforcement, let's break that down because there's a lot of misconceptions about their role in this fight. I want people to understand that in general, and this spoiler alert, this goes back to this problem being intentional, okay? In general, law enforcement, the men and women on the front lines are not trained to handle human trafficking related issues, are not given that training are not given a budget or resources. That's intentional. Just letting you know. I know a lot of... You would think for such a huge problem as it is nationwide, you would think that would be run-of-the-mill required training aspect. Yep. I've talked to so many law enforcement agents, current and former, who care so much that they put themselves through like third-party training and human trafficking interdiction training and things like that with their own time and money on their off weekend because they were encountering it so much and they did not know what to do. I talked to so many stories, but one specifically stands out. There was a law enforcement veteran of about 20 years in law enforcement and just a good guy. And I was telling you about my story and you could tell like he was moved and pissed off in all the right ways. And he said, you know, one time I made a traffic stop and I pulled over some kind of van SUV and something seemed off. So I just followed my gut instinct and I went around to the back and opened the door. And there was about 15, 18 children there in the back just being transported them jumped out and grabbed him like a you know like a bear hug and he was just he said I I just froze this kid was you know hugging on me for for help and I would just froze like did not know what to do so what I need people to understand imagine being approached with something like that and not it's all about what they're authorized to do they can't like act out of training and make things up you know I mean within reason i'm just saying like they have to work within protocol and if they are not given a protocol you're like okay so what people should understand is that yes of course law enforcement should play a massive role but it's not the men and women on the front lines who don't care it's normally that they care a lot but that their yeah. leadership their superiors first of all are not giving them the training or the resources and are actually blocking them from doing something about this assigning them to everything but this when something happens they take them off that case and reassign them somewhere else i need people to know that it's not that you have to go hit up that random cop on the street and tell him to do something about it i need you to go to the sheriff and to the district attorney and to the attorney general 
And I need you to hold them accountable because first of all, you should educate yourself about how the law enforcement process works. Because for example, the district attorney is not the investigator. The district attorney is the prosecutor. If people bring them cases, they can then choose whether or not to prosecute. And that's when we hold them accountable to do so. But who's investigating this? Who's actually, so unpack all the layers of how it works in your neighborhood. There's how it's supposed to work. And then there's who's actually running it and how it's actually working. Let's be real. Yes, it's a so step by research. step process that goes Absolutely. from entity A to entity two and so Correct. on. And that's where I'm asking you to get involved in your local community. That means when the sheriff is up for re-election, attend those events or donor parties or whatever and be face to face with them because they want your attention right now. So you can say, hey, nice to meet you. So what's your plan for solving human trafficking in our neighborhood? How many arrests and convictions have you made? What's the process? What are the obstacles? How have you been supported or have you been blocked? Who's really responsible? And they may try to issue the responsibility on other people, but at least you can get a better understanding whether or not it's an excuse of who's involved. And then you can go call them and hit them up. So I've done this a lot and I am a petite female who's not tactically trained and has no government credentials. Like I need people to know I did not ask for permission and you don't have to either. You just have to get involved. You just have to show up like this matters and you're one of many people who should be showing up and your voice should be heard. Absolutely, absolutely. But you can't be heard if you don't speak up. So we gotta start opening our mouths. Yeah, absolutely. So especially to all the people, you know, oh, this will never be solved until the different administration or until they close the border until. Cool story. I don't disagree with you, but I'm also holding you accountable. Have you talked to your mayor, local official? Like, it well, was- and who controls that? Oh, you, we control that. Are you, you, they work for you. Are you managing them correctly? Like, I'm not even trying to be cute about the responsibility, but it changes the dynamic of instead of issuing blame, are you actually taking action or are you just sitting there blaming them? Because that's not helping anybody. We have to do our part as well. Yeah, it's their responsibility, but it's our responsibility to hold them accountable and make sure that they're aware. Look, we know this is an issue and we expect you to do something about it. Absolutely. And they need to know that we are holding them accountable for that exact issue and that we will not vote for them if they are not prioritizing the protection of children. So again, I'm not saying to go in there and confront and make enemies. I'm saying to go in there with a smile and wave and make friends and make sure they know that you're there and that you are holding them accountable. Make sure they know that we may even publicly expose them if they don't keep their word and or if they're failing to prosecute and or we should, you know, make public knowledge about we, you know, for example, in this district, no arrests or convictions of human trafficking have been made in this district. You know, we have not seen action against this and we know it's happening in our community. Why do we have a center for these survivors of child trafficking? We have a lot of animal shelters, which is great. But are we actually supporting survivors? Where would we expect them to go if they were to escape or be rescued? Who's actually supporting that and what can we do to actually be part of the solution? Now, I want to segue into another community that I know could be very helpful in this fight and who I believe has a responsibility to be leading by example and who, in general, I have not seen on the front lines of this fight. So earlier I said that I was born and raised in an international religious cult and that they were Christians. And by the way, that means that 100% of the abuse was done in the name of Jesus and God in the Bible. And 100% of the abusers were Christians. Now, I've heard it all and well-meaning people say, I'm so sorry that happened to you, but those weren't real Christians. And I said, okay, cool story. So here's my question. Where are the real Christians? Is the church leading by example? Is the church on the front lines when it comes to protecting children in our community? Is the church statistically a safe haven for children or are they sometimes safe havens for predators? Now, look, I'm not against anybody's religion or spiritual practice. I do know the Bible in three languages, so I'm going to get biblical only when I'm speaking to Christians. Because here's the thing, whether or not you pray in a building or in your bed, how be it the spirit of the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So it totally makes sense that you'd be praying in a building or temple. But my point here is that that going to the building or the praying, that is not your service to God. That's your nourishment for you. Like, cool. I drank water today. Cool. That's for me. 
that's not my service to others. That is nourishment that helps me be hydrated and continue to serve. It is a necessary part of my nourishment, but it is not my service to others. Okay. Now, first of all, let's put that in perspective. And let's also put into perspective the words of Jesus, who said pretty emphatically, not once, but twice in the New Testament, when he was talking to a group of people and some kids tried to come through and they wouldn't let the kids through. And he said, let the little children come unto to me. And then he said, by the way, he got pretty gangster about this. He said, it would be better for you to hang a millstone around your neck and drown in the bottom of the sea than for you to offend one of the little ones. Notice he didn't say violate or defile. He said offend, which is a really broad term because it literally means cause them to stumble or feel bad. So Jesus was pretty gangster when it came to that concept. And I think it's interesting. This verse means a lot to me because first of all, it's mentioned in Matthew and again in Luke. And it's also pretty creative in terms of a punishment for what he thought was obviously that punishable because scientifically, you know, you can't put a 2000 pound millstone around your neck, first of all, and it's not like a normal punishment in those days. So I feel like Jesus was being creative. And he was like, you know, in my modern day terms, it'd be like, go peel your face off before I catch you hurting one of these little ones. Right. Okay. You're getting some extra for that shit. <laughs> he did not play. And it wasn't like, go pray your sins away. It was like, <laughs> okay, no so I love that you. energy. Now, here's my question. Because every time I do a speaking event, whether it's hundreds or thousands of people watching or listening, I ask, you know, I I walk people up to this and then I say, is your church, is your preacher, pastor person talking about child trafficking in the United States? And I've until last night, I got three people who said yes. Normally, I've never gotten more than two people in a crowd or in the live stream comments who said yes. My church is making sounds with their mouth about the thing Jesus said was super important to do. So back to my question, is the church leading by example? And if not, why? More specifically, is the church showing up with that kind of millstone energy or are they afraid to even talk about it? Because if you identify as a Christian or as a follower of Jesus or whatever, he was pretty specific about what he thought about children and the way that he elevated their status, if you will, in terms of importance. It was very specifically stated multiple times, not just that verse, but in general. So if still today you're not, I mean, how many dozens of times is that in the Bible? Absolutely. Now, look, I'm mature and healed enough by choice that I understand that it wasn't Jesus and God in the Bible abusing tens of thousands of us children. I understand those were bad people that were abusing the power in order to control people. Okay, I got it. But where are the real Christians? I don't see them leading by example. I'm just going to narrow down on this specific topic because that's really my battle. I don't see the church leading by example. I don't see them showing up like if God be for us, who can be against us? And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I don't see in general Christians with that energy and we need that energy in this fight. We need the churches to be safe havens for children, for families. Did you know that statistically over 95% of In one study, they did an Abel Harlem study with a psychiatrist of convicted child predators. Over 95% of those predators consider themselves religious. Really? To me, that's not surprising because of how I was raised. But for most people, that's very surprising. I know, like, this is from that sample size. They consider themselves religious. So here's my message also to the public. Please don't assume that just because someone is sitting next to you in the same building, praying to the same God in the same way that you're praying, don't assume they're necessarily safe for your children. Because here's the thing. I'm not here to pick on churches. I am here to expose the truth. And the truth is that predators exploit vulnerabilities. Predators will target people or communities that they consider vulnerable. So in the same study, they admitted that Churches and faith-based communities are very welcoming. They assume the best of people, et cetera, et cetera. No one has to apologize for being welcoming and assuming the best in people. But what I'm saying is that, first of all, if we have this open door environment to come one, come all, and we're not vetting who has access to the children, we're not vetting who we're associating with in there and who's, you know, the leadership and that kind of thing. And we have a naive assumption that they're so great because they're good Christians. 
There's always a wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, no, I'm not attacking anyone's belief. I'm saying be aware that predators are strategic and they will exploit vulnerabilities. Now back with the statistics. Did you know that predators in faith-based communities compared to secular environments have more victims and younger victims? Really? I did Look not up on It other- makes sense because, I mean, the younger the victim, the easier that they are to manipulate and coerce and control. Predators will specifically, intentionally position themselves in places of power and authority in order to gain access to children. Am I saying they're all bad? No, but I'm saying if you are a predator, you would want that place of power and authority because people trust you. They assume you're great for everybody, including children. They assume that you're safe, God, peace, and love. However, we need to be aware that while there are a lot of amazing people who attend church and are great people, predators are strategic and they will exploit those vulnerabilities and your trust and your welcoming. So I'm asking people to really get to know Everyone that has access to their kids. Do not assume they're safe. Ensure that they are safe before you ever leave your child alone, whether it's in the Sunday school or at a school or at someone's sleepover or birthday party or amusement park. Please don't assume that just because they are a worker there or just because they have some sort of authority there that they are necessarily safe for children. This is where awareness gets uncomfortable but real. This is where awareness can turn into action because it's one thing to be aware. It's a different thing to take action and make the appropriate action in response to whatever the situation is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some scary stuff. And it's sad that we have to think about things like this, but I mean, it is what it is. And if you want to keep yourself and your children safe, then I mean, it's just one of those things that you have to consider and you have to look into and do something about. Correct. I would, along with asking people to go to their local sheriff's department or mayor, I would like people, even if like me, you don't go to church, I would like to encourage you to get involved in your local church. If you want to make a difference, I would like you to go to your preacher, pastor person and ask them, what are we doing to prioritize the safety of children? Second question, what is the protocol if someone is found to be abusive of children? What's the protocol? How is that handled? Who takes care of that? Who receives those reports? Are those reports turned over to law enforcement or are they kept secret inside the church? And is the perpetrator moved from this church to that church so that no one finds out? If you don't get satisfactory answers to your questions, because I do want you to probe and any non-predatory environment should have no problem answering those questions. If you don't get satisfactory answers, if you're brushed off for six months, I want you to find a different church. That's yeah. where I'm that plane. Amen. You know what? I had a thought. My big brain is just always <laughs> cooking something <laughs> crazy up. Solutions to this very solvable uh, problem. Uh, right, can right. we I'll break like first? What about putting together like a PDF or something of, of sorts of some sample questions and things and, and letter form or something of that sorts that, you know, viewers and users can download and because uh, some people yep. are just lazy and oh, I feel you. Think, uh, everything. Oh, here, look, we did all the work for you. I feel you to my core, girls. Here's the thing. Like, I'm the kind of person where I'm like, here's the knowledge, go do something with it. And people are like, wait, I don't understand how to chew this bite. I'm like, Lord. Okay. So with a smile on my face, I created a program. Ready? It's called Activate the Church. And there is a checklist style free resource that anyone can download and take to their church and say, how are we doing? Let's rate us out of these It's around maybe 70 points, and they're all very cost-effective, very practical things that should already be implemented. But if not, oopsie, let's do better, and let's make sure they take these seriously. These are even practical things like fire safety exit doors, because a lot of times in the back rooms where they have the kids, they don't have fire escape doors. I don't go to church. I'm just reported these things by a lot of people, and I was like, that's ridiculous. Let's solve this problem. So I worked with a friend of mine who's actually an engineer and who reported about a lot of these churches. So we implemented this whole system that's very cost effective. And if you have none of these things done and you have to do all of them from scratch, it shouldn't cost you more than a couple thousand dollars. And I know that churches have that. So me with my sarcastic sense of humor and me with my intolerance for inaction, I'm like, here's a checklist. I made it for you. 
No more excuses. Ha. No, no, not at all. And it's also so it's, it accomplishes two things. One, I truly want the churches, faith based communities to ramp up their efforts to protect children. Like ultimately, my goal is to make them not only safe, but lead by example. Yes. I want to help them. And if that, you know, if I need to spoon feed them, here, so be it. <laughs> but point two, I want people to have a resource that they can use to vet their church and realize whether or not the church is up to par when it comes to protecting children. So I'll send you those PDFs or if you want to post it with yeah. this free resource. And I encourage yeah, people to take them on my record. website too. I'll shoot. I'm going to have those bad boys floating around everywhere I can. Yeah. Yep. That's such a genius idea. Right. That's really awesome. And you know, what better way to, you know, bring the people and the church together to right. unites everybody and brings everybody together over a very specific issue that desperately needs help. And I mean, we got to start somewhere, you That's know, cool. and, you know, as a Christian myself, I take that very seriously. Since I did start walking closer with God after I almost lost my life and it, it was pretty crazy and intense situation. I, I was fortunate to where I could see him working in everything. And I knew right then and there, I have responsibilities. Yeah. I am here for a reason. I am here for a purpose. Yes. And we have to fulfill that. We have to do everything that we can to try to encourage others as well to follow the same path. I mean, and even if, even if you're not religious, I mean, that matters none. Just Absolutely. doing the right thing. There's right and there's wrong. Whatever Absolutely. you believe, however you want to look at it, it's that simple. Do the Absolutely. right thing, you know? Absolutely. 1,000%. One last thing I'll add because my brain is pretty extensive. And here's the thing, when I escaped that cult, you know, initially you just hit the ground running and the, the mode is survival. So you don't even have time to like, what do I believe and why? That's a whole process of unraveling and, you know, deconstructing and reconstructing and all these things. So that's a whole other book. But my point is that I actually have a very strong spiritual connection and I, and I very much not only value that, but I know the truth of that. I know the, the presence of that. And I also know the difference between spirituality which is your connection directly with a higher power and you feel that and it's undeniable and separately there's religion. Yes. Which is a business yeah. with a middleman who collects a toll and who translates the God, God's word for you or, you know, who translates that higher power for you. And I don't believe that's how we're meant to interact with the divine. And I don't believe that that's, you know, the way Jesus instructed. But my point is that I'm not here to take anyone's belief. However, this is a, a, you know, a very long story short, different subject, but a lot of things were used to manipulate us like the words God and Jesus and love and truth and a lot of other things that were just grossly twisted and manipulated against us our entire childhood. So reconstructing a relationship or comfortable level with some of those words has been a process. And so just for anyone who like me is not religious or can't relate, or maybe it's even triggering for you still, the word God just didn't have a meaning to me because first of all, it's like, ew, man in the sky, no thanks. But it was also just the conforms of religion that was not a Feeling, it just didn't have a meaning to me, right? So I replaced the word God with power, which actually makes things a lot more like, to me, the word powerful, power is expansive and it's everything, yeah. I guess, God means to people. It's so big. It's a very big <laughs> word. To me, that's what, that's, you know, what, what God means to most people, like that, that word resonated to me. So first of all, I want to encourage people that don't get stuck on the word or whatever the trigger is. Realize that some terrible, evil, cowardly person manipulated you or abused you or whatever, and that's their BS, but you don't have to lose your connection with the divine. So first of all, there's that, like... That's your power. You're meant to have that. But also the word love or that concept, it's still, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm still working on that because it's still a little bit awkward for sure. But when we talk about the Christian faith and the commandments Jesus gave, the greatest of which were love. Now, what does love mean? And I'm not going to lie. I'm still trying to figure that out when it comes to all the different applications of it. But my point is more specific to, is it love? to ignore children being harmed? Would love turn a blind eye? Could you call yourself Christian and not have love, which is, in my opinion, not only compassion and empathy, but it's also action. If you love your child, you don't just wish them well. 
you care for them, you protect them, you take action, you instill values in them, you educate them. It's an so, all encompassing word and yes, thought and yes, action. And it's feeling. not a, just, it's not an emotion. It's an action. It's a state of being. So again, I'm not the expert on trying to unpack that definition. I just know for sure it's not thoughts and prayers. It does yeah. involve some form of action or showing up like it. So because there's so much emphasis from the words of Jesus on the importance of love in the Bible and in many different religions, I want people to think about, you know, what would Jesus do? And if you're calling yourself a believer or follower of Jesus, there are some pretty specific instructions and concept in that book. There's also, you know, love others, love yourself. And the greatest of these is love. And without love, it's nothing. There's a lot of emphasis on certain concepts and instructions that I believe we, the people, whether or not you're religious, it would benefit us to take those things very seriously because it would result in a much better humanity with a lot less violence and corruption and also inaction because none of those things are love. I mean, we're setting we're setting the stage right now for future generations. And if it's this bad right now, can we... I I don't even want to think about what it's going to be like in 25 years if we keep doing nothing. Correct. We won't let that happen. I'm just going to speak for everyone in this one instance. We are not going to let this continue thriving. We are not okay with this being the fastest growing and the most profitable criminal enterprise. We are not okay with this happening in our borders by our elected officials to children who cannot consent or overpower or fight back. It's up to us to not only be their voice, but to take action. Yes. We need to hold them accountable and we need to do our part because faith without works is dead. Absolutely. We, the people are coming. That's right. We here, <laughs> we here. I want to acknowledge and really thank you and people like you who there's very few of you, unfortunately, who are not only willing to be aware yourself, but who are willing to talk about this message and feature it on your platforms and get other people to pay attention to it because it takes people like you. We know that the mainstream media won't do it. We know that our politicians, no, they, unfortunately, our churches aren't doing it yet. Well, so we're, we're working on like that. Me, that's right. <laughs> we're here to get louder. So I just thank you so much for having yeah, me and sharing okay. this message and for being such a supporter because I can I can feel it when it's genuine and I, I promise you it matters. So thank oh, you. Oh, for sure. For sure. And and we're working really hard at growing my teams. I mean, this all, it took off like wildfire from day one that I announced that I was doing this, you know, and it just goes to show how massive of a desperate need yes. that there is for survivors to, you know, be able to feel like they have some place to go to be heard, Absolutely. you know, for so many people to feel that way is just so heartbreaking. And as a society, we need to accept and recognize that that's not okay. And we need to hold ourselves to a bigger, better, higher accountability to just do better. Absolutely. Absolutely. It starts with us. So and we you. can do it. Go team oh. go. Do it. We must. We absolutely must. Yeah. Well, let's kick some ass, getting some information out there. Definitely. Thank you again for all you do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you are an absolute inspiration and so happy that you're here and that you got safe and that you're fighting to create change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess empowerment is the choice to fight back. So I'm grateful. Absolutely. For sure. I am so excited that you got to join me and I look forward to doing things more in the future and seeing yeah. how we can grow this and, and make sure that awareness is being properly brought. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.